Before you listen, if you enjoy the stories and want to hear more, then please consider subscribing. Most of you listening aren't subscribed, so please take this time to subscribe. Turn on notifications so you'll never miss a story and be the first to hear. You'll also be supporting me. Thank you. I still get chills when I think back to that terrifying night. It was supposed to be just a normal first date after matching with someone named Jake on a dating app. From our conversations, he seemed nice enough, if a little quiet and awkward. When we agreed to meet up at a local restaurant that Saturday evening, I didn't think much of it. I arrived at the restaurant first and let the hostess know I was meeting someone. She led me to a small table towards the back where I sat down to wait, sipping on a glass of water. About ten minutes later, I saw a tall, lanky guy enter and start glancing around. He made eye contact with me and walked over. Hi, are you Tina? He asked nervously. Wet nodded yes. He broke into a timid smile. I'm Jake. Nice to meet you, he said, extending his clammy hand for me to shake before sitting down across from me. Up close, I noticed Jake was very fidgety, constantly wiping his palms on his pants and avoiding eye contact. Once we ordered drinks, an uncomfortable silence fell over us. I tried to break the ice by asking Jake about his job and hobbies. He gave short, vague answers before quickly steering the conversation back to asking me endless questions. At first, I didn't think much of his curiosity, but soon the questions became oddly specific and fixated on the minor details of my life. He would ask things like, what street you live on, and who would usually grab coffee with in the mornings before work. If I mentioned a friend's name, he would press for exactly how we knew each other and where they lived. The way Jake's eyes would light up when I revealed some mundane aspect of my routine was unsettling. He seemed very interested in my daily schedule, what time I woke up, the route I drove to work, who I ate lunch with on a typical Tuesday. The intensity of his stare while waiting for each answer made me squirm in my seat. About halfway through our meal, I really started to notice Jake's weird mannerisms. He kept craning his neck to stare whenever someone entered the restaurant, as if he was looking for a specific person. Under the table, he would also constantly fiddle with his cell phone in his lap. Every so often, he would rapidly scroll through something before placing the phone back down and returning his focus to me. Things took an even more alarming turn later into the dinner. Jake made a casual comment about a work project I had briefly mentioned earlier, a proposal I had stayed late to finish a few nights prior. The thing was, I definitely did not tell him any details about that project during our conversation. I felt a chill go down my spine. How could he possibly know something so specific about my work schedule? I became determined to end this date and get home. I made up an excuse that I wasn't feeling well and needed to leave early. Jake's eyes flickered with what looked like anger briefly before he rearranged his face into a look of concern. He insisted on walking me to my car, saying he wanted to make sure I got there safely given I wasn't feeling well. This excessive worry felt odd from someone I had just met a few hours ago. We walked in thick silence through the dark parking lot to my car. My heart was pounding as I fumbled in my purse for my keys, constantly glancing behind me a cute eye on Jake trailing close behind. Under the dim lamplight, I noticed him pulled his phone out again, angling it at me as if taking a photo. My chest tightened. What was happening here? I quickly jumped into my car, mumbling a cursory goodnight to Jake before locking the doors and speeding off. As I flew out of the parking lot, I couldn't resist looking in. My rearview mirror, under the glare of the streetlights, I could see Jake still standing there motionless, watching me drive away into the night. A cold panic washed over me as I realized he must have been stalking me online for weeks, gathering information about my personal life and routines without me even realizing it. That explained how he knew so many precise details I had never shared with him. I took a deep breath and tried to focus on getting home safely. But soon a pair of headlights in my rearview mirror drew my attention. They were brighter than the other cars around me. A sinking feeling took hold in my stomach as I realized it was Jake following me. I sped up, but the car continued tailing me, matching me turn for turn through the dark, winding streets. My heart was racing in palms, sweating as I desperately tried to lose him, blowing through stop signs and taking random turns down residential side roads. But he stuck right behind me, the headlights in my mirror getting closer and closer. After 15 agonizing minutes, I whipped into the parking lot of a bustling 24-hour supermarket and ran inside, 
weaving between the aisles until I found the security guard. I quickly explained I was being followed, and he let me stand by his side, calling for backup. From the window, I watched Jake slow to a crawl past the store before seeming to give up, his headlights disappearing into the night. The security team escorted me safely back to my car once it seemed the coast was clear. I drove home in record time, constantly checking around me and locking my doors immediately once parked. I shut all my window blinds and barely slept that night, my mind racing with chilling thoughts of Jake lurking outside my home. In the weeks following that harrowing experience, I found myself looking over my shoulder everywhere I went, worried I would spot Jake following me again. I took a break from dating apps, too rattled to even consider me more strangers online after what had happened. I hoped I would never come face to face again with the man who turned a simple first date into the most terrifying night imaginable. The memory still sends a chill down my spine, making me question if I'll ever feel safe on a date again. I was really looking forward to my date with Olivia. We had matched on a dating app a few weeks ago and hit it off right away. She was gorgeous in her photos with long black hair and bright green eyes. And she seemed so cool, we liked all the same bands, movies, everything. So when she suggested meeting up, I was 100% down. I got to the restaurant early, got us a nice table, and kept watching the door eagerly for her to arrive. My heart sank though when I saw the girl who walked in. She looked absolutely nothing like Olivia's photos. I'm talking different face, hair, body type, even her skin tone was different. Despite all that, she made eye contact with me and headed to the table. I tried not to look as shocked as I felt. Hey, I'm Olivia, she said with a smile. I gave an awkward hello back, still searching her face to try and find even a hint of the girl I'd been talking to. As we attempted some stiff small talk, I just kept staring at her trying to figure out what was happening. Finally, I just had to say something. So, you look really different than your pics, I said, trying not to sound accusatory. Olivia's face fell and she got super embarrassed. She confessed that no, those actually weren't pictures of her at all. She admitted she was insecure about how she looked, so used someone else's photos that she thought were prettier. I felt bad for her, but I was also really weirded out and upset that she catfished me like that. The rest of the date was painfully awkward. We could barely keep a conversation going because all I could think about was whether she lied about other stuff too. After Olivia came back from the restroom, things somehow got even stranger. She sat down and told me she needed to come completely clean about something. Apparently, her name wasn't even Olivia. It was Oliver. She explained that she had been born male but transitioned to become female. She started crying and apologizing for deceiving me this whole time. I was just stunned. This entire date felt like something straight out of a movie. I did my best to keep an open mind, but inside I felt totally betrayed and upset. This person had completely misrepresented themselves to me. I was still trying to wrap my head around the fact that the girl I had been talking to was actually a man named Oliver. It was a lot to take in, to say the least. We left the restaurant quickly after her confession, both of us feeling awkward and uneasy. I gave her a brief hug goodbye and then couldn't wait to get out of there. My mind was racing the whole drive home replaying the crazy events. I couldn't believe the girl I had been so excited to meet turned out to be a completely different person, and not even the same gender. When I got back to my apartment, I immediately took a long hot shower, as if I could wash the whole bizarre experience off of me. I kept imagining telling my friends this story and their shocked reactions. They were never going to believe what happened tonight. As I laid in bed much later unable to sleep, my thoughts kept circling back to the date. I had such conflicting emotions about the whole thing. I was upset at being lied to, but I also felt bad for Olivia or Oliver and what she or he must be going through. The entire situation was just so surreal and confusing. In the end though, I'm glad I handled it with empathy instead of getting angry. But the experience definitely taught me to take online profiles with a grain of salt. People don't always reveal who they truly are until you meet face to face. I'd be way more cautious now I believe anything I see on dating apps. The next morning, everything that happened still felt so unbelievable. Part of me wondered if I just imagined or dreamed the whole crazy night, but no, it really happened. I went on a date expecting to meet a girl named Olivia, and instead met someone completely different who turned out to be a trans woman named Oliver Catfishing Me. Definitely not what I was expecting for my Thursday night. 
My friends were just as shocked when I told them the story later. They had so many questions, wanting every detail of this absolutely insane date I somehow ended up on. I don't think I'll ever forget meeting Olivia's eyes when she first walked into the restaurant looking nothing like her photos. Or the sinking feeling in my gut when she revealed she used to be Oliver. Just such a bizarre experience all around. I'm still processing it all, to be honest. It left me feeling kind of unsettled about online dating as a whole. You just never know who a person really is or what they might be hiding. I guess all you can do is keep an open mind if you end up in a surprising situation. And maybe be a little more cautious with believing someone's profile right off the bat. Expect the unexpected, I suppose. So yeah, that's the story of definitely the strangest and most memorable date I've ever been on. Not exactly the romantic evening I was envisioning, that's for sure. But it's an experience I know I'll be telling friends about for a long time. Just another tale of the inherent risks that come with modern day. You win some, you lose some. At least I have one hell of a catfish story now. Never a dull moment when you're out there in the online dating world. Oh man, I still get chills when I think about my horrific date last night with Edward from the dating app. What possessed me to swipe right and agree to meet up with that creep? He seemed normal enough chatting online, but meeting up with him in person was a huge mistake. We decided to go to this cozy little Korean restaurant downtown for dinner. I arrived first and got us a booth in the back corner. I checked my makeup in my compact and practiced my relaxed to date night smile. By the time I saw Edward enter the restaurant, I was feeling optimistic. He was cuter in person than in his pics. Tall and slender, with wavy brown hair and surprisingly intense dark eyes. I stood up to greet him with a hug. He smelled good like clean laundry. We sat across from each other and began browsing the menus. The conversation was a little awkward and formal at first, but that's typical for a first date with a stranger. I asked about his job, financial analyst, his hobbies, guitar, running, reading history books. He seemed intelligent and put together, if a bit reserved. After we ordered some Korean barbecue to share, I thought things were going pretty well. I was just starting to think maybe this date wouldn't be a bust after all. And then Edward completely derailed the night with his disturbing confession. I can't recall exactly how we got on the morbid subject, but suddenly Edward was opening up about his obsession with dead bodies. He went into graphic detail about how fascinating he finds their textures, the hardness of bone beneath leathery flesh. His eyes grew animated in a manic way as he described the allure of a corpse's waxy stillness and the intoxicating scent of decay. I froze with my chopsticks midair, watching him rhapsodize about his macabre interests. Then he told me his ultimate fantasy, obtaining a fresh body and sleeping next to it through the night. I kid you not. I was completely disturbed but tried not to show it outwardly. How could he think it was acceptable dinnertime conversation to confess his desire to cuddle up with a freaking corpse? I wanted to flee the restaurant right then and there, but our server arrived with the sizzling plates of meat and vegetables. I picked at the food by appetite banishing as Edward enthusiastically elaborated on chilling topics like rigor mortis and burial methods. By the time we finished eating, I was sweating, praying the server would hurry with a check. As soon as it arrived, I threw down cash for my share and made up an excuse about needing to get home to walk my dog. I don't have one. Edward said he had a great time and suggested meeting again soon. I just smiled tightly and bolted for the door. I felt bad for the restaurant staff who had to continue waiting on him after I left. I kept checking behind me on the dark walk to my car, creeped out that he might try to follow me. As soon as I got home, I scrubbed every inch of my skin in the hottest shower trying to wash away the contaminated feeling left by that traumatic date. It goes without saying that I will absolutely not be seeing Edward again. Hell no. As soon as I woke up this morning, I deleted our entire dating app exchange and his number for my phone. I almost deleted my whole account after that nightmare of a date. Who knows what other creeps are on that app, pretending to be normal before revealing their sick fantasies. For now, dating feels much too risky. I'd rather be single forever than chance going out with another weirdo obsessed with culling corpses. Love just thinking about it makes my skin crawl. I'm so disturbed that Edward seemed excited and eager on the date rather than ashamed. How could he tell me something so revolting and think I'd be intrigued instead of completely horrified? I cringe imagining what else he might be hiding if he was willing to reveal such disgusting interests right off the bat. And then to ask to see me again. 
at least I got out of there before ending up chopped into pieces in his freezer. Note to self, always background check dates before meeting them. You just never truly know someone until you spend time with them in person. I learned that the hard way. I doubt I'll be able to shake this experience for a long time, if ever. The graphic details Edward shared keep popping up in my mind when I least expect it, making me shudder. I'm even losing sleep worrying he might start stalking me and I'll end up starring in some real-life horror movie. All I wanted was a nice dinner with someone new. Now I have to live with the trauma of listening to a stranger romanticize sleeping with corpses over a bim -bap. Just another cautionary tale of online dating gone wrong. Swipe carefully, friends. Monsters are definitely lurking behind seemingly harmless profile pics. Uh, I still feel like I need to scrub my brain from the inside out. Here's hoping I can move on and not end up completely swearing off dating forever after one bad apple. Gotta get back on the horse eventually, once I've thoroughly vetted them from afar. Maybe I'll even invest in that taser while I'm at it. I've been looking forward to this date all week. After swiping right on Sabrina's profile and exchanging a few flirtatious messages, we had finally decided to meet up for dinner at a charming little Italian restaurant downtown. As a devout Christian, I was always a bit cautious when it came to dating, but there was something about Sabrina that had piqued my interest. Her profile pictures showed a stunningly beautiful woman with captivating green eyes and a warm, inviting smile. I figured a simple dinner couldn't hurt, and hey, maybe I could make a new connection. When I arrived at the restaurant a few minutes early, I requested a cozy table in the corner and waited nervously for Sabrina to show up. My palms were a bit sweaty, and I couldn't help but fidget with my napkin as I went over possible conversation topics in my head. First dates always made me a tad anxious, but I tried to push that aside and focus on being present and engaged. Finally, Sabrina arrived, and I was immediately struck by how stunning she was in person. Her long, dark hair framed her face perfectly, and those piercing green eyes that had caught my attention online were even more captivating up close. We exchanged warm greetings, and as we settled into our seats, the conversation flowed surprisingly easily. Sabrina was charming and witty, and I found myself quickly relaxing and genuinely enjoying our time together. However, the mood shifted abruptly when, in a hushed tone, Sabrina leaned in and said she had something important to tell me. My heart raced as she confessed that she was interested in getting into the world of spicy content creation and was looking for someone to collaborate with. I was completely taken aback. As a devout Christian, I knew that this was completely at odds with my beliefs and values. I tried. To let her down gently, explaining that I couldn't be involved in anything like that, as it went against my faith and principles. I even told her it was wrong for a woman to sell her body like that, and it was not at all comfortable with me being part of the whole operation. Sabrina seemed disappointed, but she didn't push the issue further, and I breathed a sigh of relief, thinking that we could just move on and enjoy the rest of our date. Little did I know that Sabrina had other plans. As we finished our meal and I reached for the check, Sabrina suddenly grabbed my hand and held it tightly. The intensity in her eyes made my heart skip a beat, and I felt the chill run down my spine. You know, I really think we could make something great together, she whispered, her voice dripping with a strange, unsettling allure. I'm not going to take no for an answer. Before I could even respond, Sabrina's grip on my hand tightened, and I felt a sharp pain shoot through my arm. I tried to pull away, but she held me in place, her nails digging into my skin. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I frantically looked around the restaurant, hoping to catch someone's attention. But the other diners seemed oblivious to the tense situation unfolding at our table. Panic started to set in as I realized that something was very, very wrong. Sabrina's hold on me only grew stronger, and I could feel the blood rushing through my veins as adrenaline kicked in. I don't know how long we sat there, locked in that bizarre and terrifying encounter, but it felt like an eternity. Finally, Sabrina leaned back, a twisted smile spreading across her face. I think you're going to change your mind, darling, she said, her voice laced with a sinister undercurrent. With that, she released her grip on my hand, and I practically leaped out of my seat, desperate to get as far away from her as possible. I didn't even bother with a check or saying goodbye. I just bolted out of that restaurant, my heart still pounding in my chest. As I made my way home, I couldn't shake the feeling of dread and unease that had settled over me. What the hell had just happened? Who was this woman, and what did she have planned? I couldn't help but wonder if I had narrowly escaped something truly horrific. 
That night, I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. The memory of Sabrina's intense gaze and her unsettling words kept replaying in my mind, filling me with a sense of unease and fear. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over, that she wouldn't just let me walk away from this. Days turned into weeks, and I found myself constantly looking over my shoulder, jumping at every unexpected sound. I had never experienced anything like this before, and it was taking a toll on my mental and emotional well-being. I tried to convince myself that I was being paranoid, that Sabrina had moved on and forgotten about me, but that nagging feeling of dread never went away. As time passed, the fear and uncertainty only grew and I found myself trapped in a state of constant vigilance. I knew that I needed to do something, but I was terrified of what might happen if I confronted Sabrina or went to the authorities. I felt powerless and alone, and the thought of what she might be capable of sent chills down my spine. In the end, I decided that the only way to truly feel safe was to leave town to start fresh somewhere else where Sabrina couldn't find me. It was a difficult decision, but I knew that I had to do whatever it took to protect myself. As I packed my bags and said goodbye to my old life, I couldn't help but wonder if I would ever be able to truly escape the darkness that Sabrina had unleashed. Only time would tell if I had made the right choice, or if the nightmare was just beginning. It was supposed to be just another nice dinner date night with my girlfriend, Sarah, of three months. We had been seeing each other pretty regularly and things seemed to be going well. I picked her up at her apartment right on time, holding a small bouquet of gerber daisies that I knew were her favorite. She greeted me at the door looking as beautiful as ever, wearing a flattering black dress and heels, with her long brown hair and loose curls. I told her she looked amazing and handed her the flowers, which made her smile happily. We drove to Marcello's, this trendy upscale Italian restaurant downtown that she had been wanting to try. When we arrived, the hostess greeted us warmly and seated us at a cozy table for two next to a large window overlooking the city lights. A candle flickered between us and a red rose adorned the table. We ordered a bottle of vintage chanty and some appetizers, scallops, prostrato, and mozzarella capris to start. The conversation flowed smoothly like it usually did with Sarah. We never struggled to find things to talk about. She entertained me with funny work stories, especially about her clueless boss who constantly made inappropriate comments. I caught her on family drama with my sister who was going through a messy divorce. Throughout dinner we laughed and bonded over our shared cynicism about relationships. When our entrees arrived, seafood risotto for her and also buco for me. Sarah insisted we try each other's dishes. She closed her eyes as she slowly savored the velvety risotto looking like she was in heaven. I told her we have to come back here so I could order it next time. For a few blissful moments, everything felt perfect, like Sarah, and I were the only two people in the restaurant. But about halfway through the meal, I noticed Sarah glance nervously over my shoulder a couple times. I turned around expecting to see a celebrity or something exciting, but there was just a middle-aged couple sitting there, nothing remarkable. When I asked her what was up, she shifted in her seat and said, oh, sorry. I just thought I saw someone I recognized. It's nothing. She quickly changed the subject to her upcoming girls trip to Miami, but she seemed distracted like her mind was elsewhere. Her eyes kept flitting to something behind me. I was starting to feel concerned that something was wrong. Suddenly a man I had never seen before marched up to our table and angrily asked Sarah, who the hell is this guy you're with? He was tall over six feet with muscular arms and broad shoulders that strained against his shirt. His dark hair was cropped short and his eyes burned with fury. Sarah's face turned pale and she froze like a deer in headlights, stuttering unintelligibly. The man turned his rage on me, his hands clenching into fists. I'm worried he was about to take a swing at me as he spat. Well, who are you, punk? I was so confused and caught off guard, I just sat there with my mouth hanging open. Before I could form any words, Sarah found her voice again and cried out, Oh my God, Victor. This is my boyfriend, Matt. I'm so sorry you had to find out this way. My mind was reeling in disbelief. Boyfriend. Her boyfriend's name was Victor. What was happening? How could she have a boyfriend? I was her boyfriend. Had been for over three months. It slowly started to dawn on me as Victor and Sarah argued loudly. She had been seeing us both lying and manipulating us this whole time. This amazing romantic relationship had all been a complete sham. 
While we eat dinner and laugh together, she'd go home to Victor afterwards as if our time meant nothing. The expensive jewelry and platform heels I bought her, the concerts, the trips I paid for, those were her real motivation. I felt sick as I realized what an oblivious idiot I had been. Of course, someone as beautiful and charming as Sarah came with a catch. She carefully crafted this web of deception, playing us both for fools. All the effort to impress her suddenly felt so hollow and pathetic. Other diners were staring as Victor and Sarah's fight escalated. He shouted, I knew you were cheating on me, you lying, manipulative rat. She shot back, don't you dare call me that. I never cheated on you. Maybe if you satisfied me once in a while, I wouldn't need to go looking elsewhere. Appalled families with children got up and left as the argument raged on with escalating vitriol. The manager hurried over and firmly asked them to leave. Victor stormed off, knocking over a chair violently and causing a scene on his way out. Sarah marched after him in her heels, not even sparing me a glance back at the table. And then suddenly, nothing. Just a flickering candle illuminating an empty chair. Reality came crashing down on me. I sat there in humiliated silence, looking at her half-eaten meal, mascara slightly smudged on the rim of her wine glass. The evidence of her calloused duplicity. I couldn't comprehend how I didn't see this coming. Were there other men being played in her twisted game? How did she juggle it all? Why didn't I notice any red flags before? How could I ever move on and trust again after being so betrayed? My festive date night had morphed into a lonely table for woolen. When the waiter came over hesitantly to check on me, I asked for the check, paid numbly, and left quietly. The drive home was a blur. By the time I got back to my apartment, fury and adrenaline had replaced the shock. I wanted to confront her, make her apologize, get closure. But I knew I needed to restrain myself. Sarah was clearly unstable, and who knew what Victor was capable of? I poured myself a whiskey and collapsed onto the couch. For the rest of the night, my mind raced in circles, Re-examining every interaction with Sarah under this harsh new light, I felt like such a chump for ever believing her. But I knew deep down it wasn't my fault. She was a master manipulator who probably preyed on many trusting men. One thing I knew for sure, I would never make the mistake of dating someone like Sarah again. Her duplicity taught me to be much more cautious and skeptical with women, not take them at face value right away. My dating life would definitely never be the same after enduring that humiliating nightmare of a date. It was a Friday night and Mary and I were both looking forward to a fun date night out. We'd been working long hours all week and were tired, so a trip to the movies seemed like the perfect low-key way to relax. I wanted to take my wife's mind off things for a bit after the stressful work week she had. We decided to see the new action thriller that had just come out, knowing it would be an engrossing couple of hours of explosions and chase scenes. After a quick dinner, we headed to the theater about 8 p.m., taking the short 15-minute walk from our apartment through the nearby streets. It was warm and clear out, the sidewalks busy but not crowded as people went about their evenings. Mary and I walked arm in arm, chatting and laughing about our days. Being together always lifted both our moons after the grind of work. As we turned down Elm Street toward the movie plaza, I pointed out a funny post someone had made on Facebook. Mary was giggling at my commentary on it went out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a man across the road staring intently in our direction. At first, I didn't think much of a passing glance, but as we continued walking, he suddenly crossed over and started following closely behind us on our side of the street. I stepped towards the man and pushed him back firmly, saying in a raised but steady voice, Back off now. She doesn't want your unwanted attention. We're leaving. For a moment, he seemed surprised at being confronted, but then his expression twisted again into one of rage. Before I knew it, he lunged at me with a swing. I threw. My arm up just in time to block the blow, but it still rattled me. My instincts took over as I grappled to restrain him, trying to pin his arms to his sides so he couldn't land any hits. He was wiry and strong, writhing in my grip and throwing elbows back to try and break free. I gripped my teeth and tightened my hold, my focus narrowing to just stopping his attacks and subduing him. Through it all, I was aware of Mary calling for help and onlookers gathering at a distance, no one yet stepping in. The man let out a wordless yell as he thrashed, finally breaking one arm free and clawing at my face. I grunted and turned my head just in time, feeling his nails scrape my cheek. 
White, hot adrenaline surged through me, and for a moment I saw red. In my fervor, I managed to wrestle him down to his knees, pinning both his arms behind his back with mine. Calm down. I shouted through heaving breaths right by his ear. We don't want any trouble, just let us pass. He continued snarling, but I held him fast, waiting for the police sirens I could now hear approaching in the distance. Only when I heard their doors slamming did I slowly release my hold and step back, hands up, hoping they could take over and the ordeal would soon be over. A surge of adrenaline took over as I grappled with a drunken, enraged man. His swings were sloppy but powerful, fueled by intoxication and rage. All I could think of was keeping him subdued until help arrived. It felt like an eternity passed, my muscles and lungs burning with the effort, when suddenly the man was ripped off me by uniformed arms. I fell back gasping for air as two police officers struggled to cuff the still yelling assailant. One asked me questions rapidly between calling for backup while his partner checked me for injuries. Shaking violently, I managed to explain what started the altercation between labored breaths. A wave of relief washed over me at the sight of Mary sobbing in the arms of another officer a short distance away. Paramedics arrived next to assess our conditions as additional patrol cars pulled up with flashing lights. My adrenaline was crashing now, turning into an intense feeling of nausea combined with surges of protective fury at what could have happened. Mary and I were separated to give statements separately to different officers documenting the events. It felt like hours, but was likely only 30 minutes total from the initial attack until we were released to go home. The perpetrator was arrested on multiple charges including public intoxication and assault. An officer escorted us back to our apartment, insisting even though we protested being fine. In the quiet of our home, the shock truly hit. Mary broke down as I held her shaking form, both processing our brushes with violence and vulnerability. Flashbacks kept me awake that night while nightmares plagued Mary's rest. We took a few days off work to recover our sense of safety again through constant reassurance of each other's presence. It was a sobering experience that heightened our awareness whenever out alone at night now, but it also strengthened our bond having faced such trauma together and come through for one another. Over time, the acute fear faded, though lingering unease remained. Small acts of caring helped us both heal, a cup of tea, back rubs before bed, long walks in daytime together. Our relationship truly felt forged and new by sharing in that night's darkness, but emerging into the light still hand in hand. My girlfriend Kate and I were so excited for our weekend trip. We had been planning this getaway for months, a romantic retreat from our busy lives in the city. Just the two of us alone together in a cozy cabin in the mountains. It was going to be perfect. We left on Friday afternoon as soon as I got off work. The forecast called for sunny skies. Kate rolled down the car window and let the warm early summer breeze hit her face, her long wavy brown hair blowing behind her. She looked over at me in the driver's seat and squeezed my hand. I'm so happy it's finally happening, she said with an adorable grin. A whole weekend away together. No cell phones, no distractions, just you and me and those beautiful mountain views. I smiled back at her, filled with love for this incredible woman. We queued up our favorite feel-good road trip playlist and sang along, letting the music and freedom of the open road fill our souls. About an hour outside the city, we turned off the main highway onto a narrow winding back road. Our GPS mapping app said this was the most direct route to the remote cabin. The paved road soon turned to gravel as we entered a dense forest. The trees grew thicker, crowding in close around us on both sides. I started to feel a bit uneasy as we drove further from civilization with no signs of life, besides the occasional deer darting across the road. The gravel road got progressively worse, riddled with axle-breaking potholes and fallen branches. We hadn't passed another car for miles now. I glanced in the rearview mirror, could no longer see the main road behind us just a dark tunnel of trees. Looking ahead, the road seemed to disappear into the forest. I suggested turning around to find our way back to the highway, but our GPS confidently instructed us to keep going straight. The app showed we still had 20 miles on this twisting, treacherous back road before reaching the cabin. As the sky darkened, Fred said, in. We were already running low on gas and now had no cell service out here in the middle of nowhere. Just then the car sputtered and jerked violently before slowing to a stop right in the middle of the woods. 
my heart sank. In the fading light, I could barely make out the shapes of massive, towering oak trees crowded tightly around us. It was completely silent except for the chirping of crickets and Kate's shaky breathing. She gripped my arm, her eyes wide with fear. What are we going to do? Kate whispered. I pulled her close, trying to hide the terror in my own eyes. Night was falling fast. We had to get out of there before total darkness swallowed us. Leaving Kate locked safely in the car, I searched the trunk for anything that could help get us moving again. All I found was a flashlight with dying batteries. I shone it around us in all directions, but the twisting back road we came in on seemed to disappear into blackness both ways. We were trapped. As the last sliver of daylight vanished, we huddled together in the cramped back seat of the car. Every little sound made Kate jump, an owl hooting ominously, a branch cracking under some unseen foot. I tried to comfort her, but my voice shook with barely contained panic. We just had to make it till morning, I told myself. Someone would come looking for us, right? Exhausted from fear and frustration, we eventually dozed off into a fitful sleep. Sometime later, I startled awake, disoriented. The car doors now stood wide open. Kate lay silent and motionless beside me, her face ghostly pale in the moonlight. My heart pounded wildly as I scanned the dark woods surrounding us for any sign of life. Only the deafening silence of the forest rang in my ears. Just then, a blinding light flooded the car. Over the crest of the hill came a park ranger truck, crunching and rumbling through the underbrush right toward us. Relief washed over me at the sight. We were saved. The ranger hurried over and checked that we were unhurt but shaken. He apologized sincerely. This old logging access road had fallen into disuse decades ago and was not maintained or on any maps. Our GPS had made a nearly fatal mistake. As the first light of dawn crept over the horizon, the ranger loaded us into his truck and delivered us to the nearest town. We got a motel room where we took hot showers and changed into clean clothes. As the sun rose outside, Kate and I held each other close on the bed, taking comfort in each other's arms. We were overwhelmed with gratitude to have survived the terrifying night to see the morning light again. We decided our romantic getaway could wait for another time. For now, we were just happy to be alive and safe. After gathering supplies, we hopped back in the car, avoided the GPS, and drove home. That weekend ended up being even better than our original plans. We ordered takeout, watched movies at home, shut out the world, and pretended we were still at that cozy cabin, just the two of us. No distractions except each other. Though it didn't go as expected, it was still a perfect getaway. My wife Jenny and I were so excited for our mystery dining experience tonight. We had booked the evening with a stranger deal at Marlowe's, this posh new restaurant downtown. The gimmick was you'd be randomly paired up with another diner for a multi-course meal. It sounded fun, adventurous, and romantic. We arrived at Marlowe's and checked in under our 7 p.m. reservation. The hostess, an elegant older woman, led us to a beautiful little booth lit by a vintage table lamp. I noticed each table had flickering candles, fresh roses, and soft jazz music playing overhead. It was clear they had spared no expense on the ambience here. After a few minutes, an older gentleman in maybe his mid-forties approached our table. He had short, dark hair, wore wire-rimmed glasses, and a tailored suit jacket. Good evening, folks. I'm Robert. It appears we'll be dining together tonight, he said warmly as he sat down across from us. We introduced ourselves and shook Robert's hand. He had a very firm grip. Robert was extremely polite and charismatic right off the bat. He asked us thoughtful questions about our jobs, lives, and relationship. I told him I was an accountant and Jenny was a paralegal. He seemed genuinely interested in getting to know us better. After we ordered some appetizers and drinks, Robert told us he was a clinical psychologist who specialized in working with the criminally insane. As the evening progressed, Robert slowly revealed strange and troubling details about his work. He mentioned several high-profile serial killer cases, like the Zodiac Killer and Jeffrey Dahmer, and implied he had evaluated the perpetrators of these infamous murders. Jenny and I exchanged uneasy looks. Was he telling the truth or just trying to scare us? When our main courses arrived, lobster for me and salmon for Jenny, Robert launched into a graphic story about one of his former patients. This man had allegedly stalked, kidnapped,
kidnapped, tortured, and killed several young women before finally being caught. Robert described extremely disturbing things the man had done to victimize and mutilate the women. I noticed Jenny had completely lost her appetite at this point. Trying to change the dark subject matter, I asked Robert about any hobbies he enjoyed outside work. He suddenly glared at me from behind his glasses and snapped, Why are you so damn interested in my personal life all of a sudden? Jenny gripped my arm hard under the table, eyes wide. After an awkward silence, Robert went back to calmly cutting into his steak as if nothing had happened. As the meal dragged on, a creeping sense of dread came over me. There was something very unsettling and almost sinister about this dining companion we had been matched with. Jenny was unusually quiet, nervously sipping her wine and avoiding eye contact with Robert. I debated calling our waitress over and asking to switch tables or dining partners, but didn't want to provoke Robert if he was in fact unstable or dangerous. When it came time for dessert, Robert insisted we try the creme brulee, claiming it was to die for. As the waitress placed it down, Robert made a bizarre, ominous comment about how easy it would be to crack someone's skull open the same way you crack the top of a creme brulee. Jenny and I exchanged panicked, worried looks. We ate our dessert quickly and silently while Robert just stared intently at us from across the booth. As soon as we finished, I quickly signaled for the check and the waitress brought it over. My hands were shaking as I put down my credit card. Robert then excuses himself to use the restroom, leaving Jenny and I alone. As soon as he was out of sight, I told her we needed to get out of here immediately. I went up front and let the hostess know there had been an issue with Robert's behavior and that we felt unsafe. She looked concerned and said she would notify the manager right away. My heart was racing as Jenny and I hurried out of the restaurant. I could feel adrenaline coursing through my veins, propelling me towards the exit. As soon as we burst through the front doors into the cool night air, we sprinted towards my car. Hurry, get in. I yelled to Jenny, fumbling to unlock the driver's side door with shaky hands. We flung open the doors and threw ourselves inside, locking the doors immediately. My hands trembled as I jammed the keys into the ignition and revved up the engine. Just as I was about to throw the car into reverse, I happened to glance back at the restaurant entrance. To my horror, I saw Robert emerging, scanning the parking lot with a perplexed look on his face. He started wandering between the cars, squinting to try and spot us. He's coming, go, 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 Jenny screamed. I slammed the car into reverse and hit the gas pedal hard, the tires squealing in protest as we careened out of the parking space. The force pinned us back into our seats as I peeled out of the lot, catching a fleeting glimpse of Robert's enraged face growing smaller in the rear view mirror. We sped down the street, my eyes darting to the mirror every few seconds to make sure we weren't being followed. After a few minutes, when I was confident we had made a clean getaway, I finally started to breathe normally again. After the adrenaline wore off, we were able to laugh with relief about how crazy the experience had been. We certainly got more mystery than we had bargained for. In retrospect, I'm glad we trust our instincts and got out of there quickly. Jenny and I agree we should definitely stick to regular date nights from now on. No more diving with dangerous strangers or crazed psychologists. This was one evening we would never forget for better or for worse. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.